Hey guys, welcome to the third episode of Iconic Podcast. This is Nick, I'm Conrad, and we're coming back to you another Monday, another episode. Nick, what do we got on the agenda today? So today we have a great conversation for you guys. And, you know, Conrad, I wanted to start off talking about, I was just recently reading an article about Lazarus. For those of you that don't know, this is a hacking group out of North Korea, and they were just recently behind the massive attack on stake i'm not sure if you're familiar with the crypto betting platform but yeah, they got off with 41 million dollars and from what i understand this is just one of many institutions organizations that have come under attack from this organization over the last few years what do you think about that bro yes yeah, so i i believe that's that's the only state funded um hacking group obviously from from north korea uh, from what i know they have three main guys which basically like orchestrate everything that uh, you know, when they were very young, they went to school to China, I think it's in Shenyang. Uh, so they've been, you know, they've been trying to, to, to learn all this malware type of stuff since they were like, uh, since they were very young. Yeah, they, then they, they came, started young. Yep, they, they came back to North Korea and, you know, they, they started, I think, in 2009 with Operation Troy when they uh, started DDoSing um, South Korean government and like their websites. And they went on to the banks. They went, you know, to the Bank of Ecuador. I think they got 12 million from one of the Ecuadorian banks. They got another few million from the Bank of Bangladesh. I think they even tried hacking banks in Poland. So like they've been they've been active for like 15 years or so. It's crazy. And from what I understand, one of the ways they've been able to actually track down this organization is based on a series of crypto addresses that they've seen um, associated with attacks that have gone down mm -hmm. in the past. But North Korea never fails to surprise me or shock me. There's always something crazy coming out of that corner of the world. But like, I'm happy to sit down with you, get a second episode underway, bro, because we got we got to get we got some good conversations to be had today. Of course. And speaking of the the Lazarus, I just saw the other day that there was actually um, I think it was FBI or like some uh, um, police agency that they actually had a picture of the the North Korean. Uh, person that orchestrated all the hacks they have a picture they have a name so they contact, contacted North Korea okay like hey like we have this guy like you know can you give it give him right, back right. to us yeah. and North Korea was like oh the, the guy doesn't exist so of course, what so, are they gonna say you know what I mean so you, so you see so you see how they work so basically they can do whatever they want and they're protected by North Korea because of all these nuclear programs and everything else like what are you gonna do to them they are already being sanctioned by almost every single country except for China and Russia so what else are you going to do to them? That's crazy. From what I understand, Russia and China are one of the only reasons that North Korea is even a thing. Mm -hmm. um, not to get off topic, but I did see a Vice documentary a little while back talking about those, how there are North Korean prison camps within Siberia. But, really? Yeah, but it doesn't come as a shock to me. You know why? Because Russia is such a massive country. People don't understand just how big Russia is. And if you look at a place like Siberia, it's like miles upon miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of nothing just pretty much forest wastelands even up north there's tundra so it doesn't really come as a surprise to me that you hear about things like this going on within the forests of siberia mm -hmm. north korea is crazy dude um and, and by the way yo what were you telling me a little while back there was a soccer player he, he i think he was north korean national but he, yes he came under fire recently it's actually a quick, little while back actually quick backstory so kim jong-un is like a big uh, soccer fan since he went to school in switzerland with his sister for a couple of years he's a big fan of inter milan so after he he took the took the lead in north korea i, I believe in 2013 he established academy a football academy where where you know he sent like the, the like the most athletic uh, you know, kids to like, you know, start learning how to play soccer. Yeah. And I think it was 2014, 2015, where they sent, I think, 14 players to Italian academies, 15 players to like uh, uh, Spanish academies to basically, you know, learn how to play better. And the best of them was the Han Kwang Song. And Han Kwang Song, he, he quickly advanced from, uh, from the youth teams and he, he got bought by Cagliari in Serie A. He made he, it out. He made it out. He, he scored a goal there. After maybe a half a year or a year of playing, he, he went to Juventus. Juventus bought him for, I believe, 3.7 million. He did not play much there. I though. have to believe that's the biggest transfer a North Korean player has ever went for. <laughs> it has to be like 3.7 million, but continue. Yeah, so I don't even know why exactly they bought him because from what I saw, they sold him, I think, the same year to like Qatar Club, Aldo Hayo. And as far as I know, they are like a little bit connected, Juventus and Aldo Hayo, so that the transfer could be done for the 
tax purposes. Right, right, right. So, you know, to make sure that the books add up. Absolutely. Um, and actually, he, he played for Qatar um, for maybe half a year or a year. He scored, like, I think, four, five goals in 10 games or maybe three goals in 10, 10 games. He was actually one of the most significant... I was uh, going to say, those are not bad stats by any means. He was one of the, the better players in the team. They, they won a championship. And all of a sudden, like, you know, the guy disappeared. So what happened was um, United Nations said that because of the nuclear tests that North Korea were performing, now all the North Korean people are sanctioned and they are not able to earn foreign currency. So basically no country in the United Nations can employ them. So they had to terminate his contract and the guy basically had to go, get on the plane, go to Rome, and he, lived, and no he lived in the, in the embassy for like, I think, a year or two years before he could finally fly back to, to North Korea after the pandemic because there were no flights to Pyongyang. Isn't that insane? Isn't that insane? From what I understand, there aren't even really any flights out to North Korea. And the mm -hmm. only place, don't quote me on this, but one of the only places you could fly out there is via China. Yeah. From what I understand. That's crazy. So I'm telling you, he literally could not play soccer for like two years and he was stuck in an embassy because he could not get back to North Korea. That's obviously the North Korean embassy, right? I, it could be, but I, but I also heard, heard of North Korean people like living in other countries' embassies. Interesting. In the meantime, that they couldn't get back. Right, right, right. That's interesting. And and also like the reason what the reason for all that was that apparently again that's not confirmed because who's, who's gonna confirm that <laughs> North, North 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 Korea is taking I think 70, 80 percent of the salary or even more of the person oh, that works and the foreign, foreign yeah. Uh, expats. Yeah, I heard so. about that. That's crazy. And so, just just bringing it back, that's probably what they were doing with the people out in Siberia, like putting them making them pretty much do labor in other countries and whatever yep. they brought back, a lot of that income would fall into the hands of other people. That's crazy. So let's say, you know, he gets paid a, a million a year and they take like 800,000, 900,000, even more. So basically like he's working for them. You know what? Like, just imagine this. Imagine you're from a place like North Korea where you're living in one of the most closed societies. Like you have very little to no knowledge of the outside world. Everything that you know is a very skewed opinion just based on the media that you consume from such a young age. I mean, obviously, it's a known fact that North Korea is a place that has a massive black market for South Korean DVDs, mm -hmm. series, you name it. So obviously, I don't think those people there are stupid. And, you know, I'm curious to know what the listeners think about this. So let us know in the comment section beneath this post if you guys think that the North Korean people are totally oblivious to the outside world or if they know that they're living within some sort of i don't know i'll call it a trap if you will so listen to that so do you know do you want to know what's the level of brainwashing north korea Tell me. so one of the defectors that's what she said um i remember in a school textbook in, in north korea it said that kim il sung took a pine cone and changed it into a bomb during the korean war and killed many americans with it that's literally what it says in the school textbook. That's crazy. I, and I, I think it's crazy how they have like in a massive hatred towards America and American people. Like they're brought up with that from mm -hmm. such a very young age. That's pretty much all they know. So imagine meeting an American person in person. There's obviously not that many going out to North Korea. By the way, dude, speaking of which, you know what? That just put me on a thought. If I'm not mistaken, isn't there some kind of conspiracy that north koreans kidnap people like there's there's a few cases per year you guys could give this a google search there's a few cases per year where people actually disappear from different countries around the world i know there was one case in japan this is going to sound odd but i think there was one in like romania mm -hmm. and they're pretty much taking people bringing them back to their country and i don't think it's for like ransom purposes but maybe to like teach certain people within their intelligence agency things about their language or culture that they ha they should know because obviously they're getting that information from somewhere you know that's interesting I, I actually haven't heard of that yeah i remember i saw i came across it on like some kind of documentary but again north korea bro it honestly never fails to amaze me and there's one other country that's pretty similar to north korea and that's eritrea you know anything about eritrea I mean, I've heard some, but I don't have that, you know. So, so Eritrea is similar to North Korea in the regard that it's another very closed society. And from what I understand, it's one of the hardest countries to obtain a visa to travel to. But what I found fascinating about Eritrea is that it's one of the only Italian colonies pretty much ever. And it's located at the Horn of Africa. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, the Horn of Africa has like Ethiopia. Yep. It has Somalia, which is another country that we obviously, we love to discuss all the crazy crap of that's course. going on over there. So 
I think that Eritrea is another very interesting place, like I said, similar to North Korea. So, dude, it's 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 just an interesting corner of the world, period, over there. Listen, even if you look at, there's ever Olympics, there's even like a World World Cup, and you see all these athletes, they literally like don't smile at anyone. They kind of have, they cannot really pretend or like they they can't really behave like they're like really curious that they like what they see. Absolutely. Because they're gonna be punished when they when they go home. Yeah. So whenever you see like they are all the time, they have this like a security guard next to them to make sure that they're not gonna defect. But there even been many occasions that the security guard of the athlete would defect. Isn't, so. that, isn't that crazy? So they pretty much have one person watching over the other. Yes. Oh my God. It's pretty much like a tell and tell, tell on the other person type deal to pretty much keep people, um, I guess, loyal to the regime. Or I don't even know if the word is loyal, but they don't really have a choice. Yeah. So even like the way like they, they suppress people is that even you cannot even trust your neighbors in North Korea because like basically everyone tells on each other because everyone is so afraid. If they would find out that, let's say, they knew that they were trying to defect and they didn't say anything, they would go to the prison camp or stuff like that. Absolutely. So I, if I'm not mistaken, being, being guilty by association. That's how it even worked in like East Germany back of the day. So basically, I think even 2.5 percent of the population were like involved into this like a neighbor neighborhood watching stuff like that. Two and a half percent of the entire population of East Germany were actually ba- basically watching over other people. So like, you you literally had. At you're, least, you're at trapped. least one or a few people. You in, are you are one hundred percent trapped. You had a few people on every single block. Oh my god! How are you gonna do something like, and they're not gonna find out? Of course, they're gonna find Dude, out. Dude, imagine the trust issues that those people have. Oh, that's crazy. You imagine trust issues now and back of the day. <laughs> <laughs> it's different. It's different. It's different level type stuff for for sure. But I can't even I can't even begin to imagine what it's like to live under a like communist or dictatorship. I should say it's. It's insane, especially these these very close societies like uh-huh. North Korea, Eritrea, as we've spoken about. So even coming back real quick to the to the soccer topic, in 1966, North Korea went to the World Cup, and they were the first team to advance from the groups to the quarterfinals. So the way it happened, the first the first game they lost to Soviet Union, I believe it was 3-0. Then they managed to tie with Chile, 1-1, and in the deciding game they won with Italy, 1-0 after penalty kick. When I'm telling you, North Korea won with Italy. You know what, though? It doesn't surprise me, Conrad, because lately, and I'm Italian, I can speak on this. Lately, Italy has been, like, garbage. Like, they've been struggling against even those tiny countries in Europe, and it's like, Italy's a legendary soccer country, you know? You have to remember, that was, like, 1966. Like, at that time, like, Italy, they were a good team. They were a very good team. you're right, you're right, you're right. They had a lot of legends. And after North Korea advanced from the groups, they... They met against Portugal in the quarterfinals. They went on the lead 3-0 after 30 minutes. And they ended up losing 3-5. to five. And after they came back home... Are you home, kidding me? I'm not kidding. Oh my they, god. From 3-0, they went to 3-5. to five. That's got to be a comeback, bro. That's crazy. And apparently, after they came back home, they were punished. And most of them you know, were sent to the prison camps. And they received a book. Uh, I believe it's called Aquariums of Pyongyang. That actually touches on that, where, where the main author said that he saw a few of the few of the soccer players in the prison camp in Yodok. That's like the prison camp, like a very popular prison camp between like a mountains. And he said that he he had like the guards were doing him a favors because he was like, you know, famous in there. Dude, can you imagine you're in prison, like you're a prisoner and you see like let's just say Christian Pulisic or like <laughs> I don't know, like Messi long story short. Like dude, that's crazy to think about. It's unfathomable to us, but that's real life for them, you know? Yeah and and from what I also heard that if you did something like very bad, you tried to escape, you tried to steal something, they were, they were closing you in a, something called a sweat box. So it was basically like a very small, dark hut where you, like, you would not get any food, you would not get anything to drink for like months. So you basically were there left to die. Th- that's pretty much, you're, you're getting tortured at that point. That's, yeah. Like the, at, th- at that point, just take me out because okay. I don't want to have to live through that. Do that. And he, he even said in the book that they had to catch rats to be able to survive, they had to eat rats to be able to survive in the prison camp. That's crazy. God only knows what food they're serving up in the North Korean prison camp. Can you imagine, bro? <laughs> um, and from what I heard, um, so from what the factors have been saying, one of the, the biggest shocks when they went from North Korea to South Korea, you know, to China and other countries, was that in South Korea, even homeless people can eat white rice. In North Korea, you can only eat white rice during like a festives. So if it's like a Kim Il Sung birthday, or it's like a holidays, that's when you get to eat white rice, and it's not even everyone. It's more often than not, it's like the, they're the, the richer people. The privileged people, you know Exactly. What I mean? So during the day you eat like a corn rice, which is like a dry corn and like bits of rice. 
That's crazy. Like, I, I, w- I honestly wonder what else is in the North Korean average person's diet. Like, obviously, they're probably not seeing protein, if not, like, on a very, very rare basis. Like, just, like, from what I understand, there was, I, if I want to say her name's, like, Yomi Park. She's the one that... Yeah, Yomi Park. I think that she was on Joe Rogan's podcast, and she was pretty much saying that the soldiers in the army... Their, their their diet is so poor that they're so malnourished and they're all very, very mm-hmm. feeble, skinny, and I weak. I heard that it's, too. It's crazy. One of the craziest things is that it's one of the countries where you cannot just go to the capital of the country. You cannot just get to the Pyongyang. First of all, you need a, you need a work permit. To, not, not a work permit. You need like a permit to get to the Pyongyang. And to be allowed to live in a Pyongyang, you have to be deemed to be a loyal person by, by the North Korean government. So when you think about this, like all these people that live like far away from the from the capital, from the Pyongyang, they're basically starving. A lot of them have to quit schools because, you know, there is no food in the family. So they have to they have to work and help, like, you know, to get the potatoes or like corn or like other stuff. So basically, like the life experience for people that live in a Pyongyang or people that live in the villages, it's so much different. It's totally, totally, totally different. And like, you know. I'm going to talk for a quick second about Turkmenistan. You know, Turkmenistan is a country that I've been fascinated with for a very, very long time. And they have a very similar situation as to what you're talking about. Because, and by the way, I I love Turkmenistan. Much love to that country. I love traveling out there. It's truly a fascinating place. But like you said, if you go to Ashgabat, Turkmenistan, it is so beautiful. You have no idea. It's even more beautiful than many other cities in that region. In fact, in the entire world. But the second that you drive outside of Ashgabat, Turkmenistan, dude, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's an entirely different world. Like, it's deserts on deserts on, des- on deserts. They're located on what's called the Karakum Desert, which means, like, the Black Sands yep. Desert. Obviously, they have a ton of oil money, hence the name. Uh, you know, like, black gold. Yep. But people are living in huts. When I say huts, I mean, like, I mean... They're probably even better than some of the houses in America these days because I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. It's crazy. That, that's, and you know, that's one of the differences between like America and Europe, right? If you look at Italy, in Italy, some of the, I don't want to stray too much off topic, but if you look at Italy, some of the, the buildings, right? Let's just say the building goes on fire. Yeah. Everything inside will get destroyed. That building is still standing there. In America, you see a fire on one of these houses. The whole house is that's a, it's ashes. It's exactly. crazy. Um, and real quick to touch on North Korea and, and their tourism, that's also one of the reasons why if you if you are able to sign up for the tour and go to the North Korea, they're not gonna so- show you villages. You're only gonna see a Pyongyang. You only you only gonna see a specific part of a Pyongyang. You always gonna be have to be a, with a tour guide. You cannot really talk to the foreigners. I mean, to like to like to, to like North Korean natives. Think about this. Imagine you're a North Korean native and you see like a foreign traveler in your country. You gotta feel like a fish in the, within a fishbowl looking at them you can't even converse with them imagine literally and i even uh i even read from experiences of people that went to north korea they were like we would literally go to let's say a train station at pyongyang and there would be like dead people on the ground yeah yeah and like the tour gets to pretend like oh like i don't see anything like there's no one there really yeah i i it's funny you'd say that because i read a book it was called if i'm not mistaken the name is the girl or the woman with seven names and it pretty much tells a story about a about a woman that escaped North Korea. If I'm not mistaken, she she went over the river that the, that separates North Korea and China in the middle of the night it, it, because in the winter it becomes like frozen over. Mm-hmm. But long story short, she said something pretty much similar to what you said about how in the train and bus stations there's like dead bodies. Like that's like a, a thing out there. Imagine how many people are starving out there, bro. Yeah, and from what I heard that if you're trying to escape from North Korea, a lot of times you have to basically hire a broker. So you have to pay this broker like a couple thousands of... Well, well, yo, real quick, just to that point. Think about this. That's no different than like a lot of Mexicans, Central and South Americans coming into the U.S. They have to pay a coyote. It's just a different word, but same thing. They got to pay thousands of dollars and they're not even guaranteed that they're going to make it across. And you said like a lot of times they have to basically like cross a desert, right? Yeah, Something they have like to that. cross a desert. Like I'll, I'll, I'll never forget. I forget who it was. One of the guys we used to work with at the restaurant, he told me that when he first came into the U.S., the way that he knew he was in the U.S. was firstly he's hiking through the desert for quite some time. He finally pulls up to a road, and when he gets to the road, he's like looking out, and he sees a car, and the license plate says Arizona on it. 
Uh-huh. So think about that. Like he knew that at that point he made it into the U.S. and he was probably like happy as a pig in shit. And you know what's crazy? Like those guys will get into cars, like clown cars, meaning packed with a ton of people, and they'll go all over the U.S. Like they'll take a, they'll be in a car from like Arizona all the way to like New York City type. Yeah, it's crazy. So just come back real quick to the to the broker situation. These brokers are so expensive too that basically a regular family has to save five, 10, 15 years to be able to afford the broker. Easily. So one person, Easily. so one person can go to China and then make money to be able to send to the back to the rest of the family and be able to, to you know to get them too. And I heard a story of this one 18 year old girl. She had a problems with her stepmom and her stepmom said that she has to go to work because you know they cannot afford you know stuff. So she convinced her that she that she should go to China. She's like, okay, I'm gonna get you a broker. You're gonna go to the broker. He's gonna get you to China. Okay. So they get to the broker. They're crossing the you know the border with with China, and he's asking her, do you have money, or you want, or should I sell you as a bride? And she, she didn't have money, so he had to sell her as a bride to the Chinese. And man. that's that's a big problem because if I'm not mistaken, in China, there's a significantly larger number of men to women mm-hmm. so i'm sure that they're looking to buy women from places like you said north korea for example that's insane and just going just touching i want to bring up a quick point when you talk about the border there if i'm not mistaken north korea actually in some way shape or form is trying to like make their end of the border look nice so that people from china looking into north korea have a better perception of the country or not even just chinese people but people that travel to that part of china all mm-hmm. the way up in the northeast it's, it's really a fascinating place where it's fascinating, fascinating that a place like that still exists today. With all the globalization, the rise of technology, how a place like that still exists. You know, but, but I, uh, I'm pretty sure that like recent years, like last five to ten years, they're getting, I guess, a little bit more access to technology. You know, they're being, to listen, they're being able to listen to like software and radio. You know, some of the people are smuggling like computers and stuff from China. Oh, of course, that's 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 for sure. So you know, it's it's getting in there. But the, from what I heard, if you're getting caught, let's say with a computer from China or with you know listening to like software oh, radio, you're done. probably like public execution. Or you you thing. either go into the to the prison camp, to the labor camp, or you're, you're, gonna you're getting the, executed. You're gonna go to the labor camp and meet the soccer player. Hmm. Yeah, he's probably still out there. No, you but uh, this is like totally crazy and. And going back real quick to the to the situation with this eighteen year old girl, you know, she was being sold as a bride to the Chinese man. Next thing you know, as as she as she said that, she uh, she had a baby with him. The baby ter- turned like two or three years old, and somehow she said she was able to get to the South Korean emb- embassy and she was able to escape to South Korea. But she said like she she probably is never gonna be able to re- reunite with the child because if she goes to China now and she t- tries to take the child, it's like she's kidnapping a yeah, child. Yeah, because, and, and not even is she just kidnapping a child, but she's putting herself at risk because from what I understand, there's a secret police within China that seeks out North Korean defectors and actually sends them back. That's, and that, you, you, don't even, you already know what happens when they go back. That's, that's 100% how it works. But from what I heard, as, as long as they get to South Korea, they're gonna be able to get like South Korean papers. And from this point on, they're like safe. Okay, they're not gonna sense. be sent back. Interesting. But if you go from North Korea, you go to China. A lot of times, a lot of times they try to go to Mongolia, you know, Taiwan or other countries. So from there, they can be sent to North, South Korea because China sends them to North Korea. So like it's it's tough. It's not just it's not just getting to China. You have to get either to to the embassy of the South Korea, which is being guarded very close. Because I even seen the videos where where uh, let's say mother with child are trying to cross the gate of the South Korean embassy, and you have a Chinese. Uh, military trying to like pull them out of the gate. Yeah, I've so they're like, clip. I've seen that. Clip. Like you know, the one leg is within the border, one is out, and they're trying to pull them out. Like Isn't that crazy. Like it's fucking insane. That's that's crazy, dude. That that's that's a struggle that we'll thank God never have to worry about. A lot of people that live in like any first world country like USA, a lot of like Northern Europe, like we take a lot of things for granted. A lot of very s- very simple things. It's crazy. You know, people take like as you said, a lot of things for granted. Like we don't appreciate what we have comparing to people like that they literally have to work all day just to eat something. And think about this, like even something as, as small as like having warm water when you shower. Yeah, you never think, think about this, but like in a lot of regions, even North Korea, they said that the power goes off like all the time. Oh, I'm sure it does. You, you can never even know the, what was the weather gonna be like because the power goes off all the time. Isn't that crazy? That's, that's, that's honestly crazy. North Korea is a fascinating place. Like I said, Eritrea has, has piqued my interest as well um i know we wanted to talk briefly about like somalia as well at some point in this podcast you know i wanted to ask you have you ever heard about that thing chat or cot yeah so 
actually speaking of cat you know what i'm talking about yes so it's it's something like it's their kind of i guess type of marijuana marijuana or something like that right it's some kind of stimulant they chew these it's, leaves it is something like that makes them i guess like to feel more at ease kind of like more chilled yep and it's it's i think it's also all over the africa yep, right you're you're 100 you're like right. so, so popular so, there. so so from what i understand it's grown on the horn of africa i i, I saw a youtube video about how much people consume this and i was genuinely shocked like this is like this is like their cup of coffee except they do it 10 more time 10 times more per day yes so even even uh, that guy if i'm not mistaken his name is michael scott that was um kidnapped by somali pirates and he was he spent two years being kidnapped before you know uh before there was a ransom paid and he could get out he said that even the guards that they were guarding him they would like chew on cut like two three times a day that's like every crazy. single day they said he, they would offer it for him but he said it was so easy to get addicted to that that he you know he he tried it like once or twice but he was like if i'm gonna try it more often i'm gonna get so addicted to it yeah i think it's more along the lines of kind of like a chewing tobacco yeah but it's crazy how in any part of the world they have their way to get high like if you look at like places like papua new guinea have you ever seen that thing it's called like beetle nut no they like they crack open this type of nut and they have like a, a mustard seed i think and long story short, they're spitting out this red liquid, but it's it's everywhere, bro. Like everyone and their mother is doing it. And going back to that, the, the topic about shot ev- or cot, whatever it is, everyone is doing that. They're eating this stuff like it's candy, and not just like you said in Africa. It grows. It's from what I understand, it's grown on the Horn of Africa, but also largely on the Arabian Peninsula. Hmm. So places like Yemen, they're also big with that. It's interesting, dude. Really. And what you just put me on the topic of? Have you heard of like? Um, do you know anything about Li- Libya? Very little, honestly. I feel like I don't know a lot. So I was just reading the other day that literally they have, they still have modern type of slaves in Libya. I've seen a couple like documents and a couple different like articles from like a few months back. Even I saw one um, video on Vice where there was a where, where there was like a guy that escaped. That basically he left Ivory Coast. He went to Libya and they caught him, and. He said, as he said, because he was black, he was like, they treated him as a slave. So basically someone bought him and he had to work on the farm. Just not, not work on the farm, like a worker. They would literally not even give him food. Whatever food they give to animals, to like, you know, sheep and stuff like, like this. Like you said, he was a modern day slave. He was a modern day slave. He, he said that they would uh, put like the food for, uh, for animals to like this big mar- marble plate. And he literally had to hide beneath the sheep and stuff like this so so the owner is not gonna see him eat so he literally had to eat not only animal food but he had to hide to eat that you know he would sleep in the shed and he would work from, to eat animal food yeah like whatever they would give to the animals he, he, he that's what he ate that's crazy he, he said he many times he had to he had to walk like hours just to find some water to drink and he said like whenever anyone caught him they would they would like basically kidnap him and make him work for them and he said, like, it took a long time before there was there was a one Libyan uh, woman that helped him, and he was able to get on the on the boat to Italy. And as he was on the boat to Italy, there was other boat that hit them and basically punctured punctured the punctured the and ship. And just like capsized. It it capsized. A lot of people died. He was he, like he remained on like the you know you know where there are like the smaller boats on like a ship. Yeah. So he was be able to remain one like of them. Like the safety boats. Type. The safety boats. And after, I don't know how long he said that was, maybe a couple of days or something like that. So I'm like, I think Italy Coast Guard found them. So they, you know, they got a helicopter. They, finally, they got them through Italy. And that's, he said, like, where his, like, normal life started. Yo, on that note, this is going to sound kind of messed up. But just on this conversation, you can get where I'm coming from. The Mediterranean there is a massive graveyard. Yeah, from what I heard, it's like think about the amount of people, bro, that have died trying to go from Africa to Europe, and, and it's 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 a crazy journey, bro. It really is crazy, dude. And I'm sure they also have similar things to what we were talking about with brokers, people mm-hmm. trying to help them get across because they're not doing it for free, bro. Of course, it's you know it like works, works like this in like a lot of different countries. It's, a, it's just the countries that no one talks about. It, there's not much information about it. Yep. It's like you know. Why would you even go to, let's say, North Korea? Why would you go to, to, to like, I don't know, Libya or, like, Somalia? Like, it's, it's so dangerous. Like, so yeah. people don't want to go there. Even today, with the exception of North Korea, they're pretty much all, like, war zones. Like, Somalia is a war-torn country. You obviously, everyone's obviously seen the movies with the pirates and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, it's not the best area to travel. It's not safe. But, but, but you do know that in Somalia, they have this other 
de facto type state called Somaliland, yep. which from what I understand is actually, I'm not going to say like a safe place to travel to, but it's not like being in Somalia, Somalia, similar to if you go to, if I'm not mistaken, it's Iraq. They have another part of Iraq called Iraqi Kurdistan, where a lot of people can go and feel safe and it's not as tense as other parts of the country. Yep. So again, I'm not sure when this recording is going to go out, but it was a couple of days ago when actually Somaliland, they signed a treaty with Ethiopia that Ethiopia would give them a stake in Eth- Ethiopian airlines for an access to the coast. So that it, it was either 20, it was 20 or 50 kilometers of, of, a coast, of a coastline that Ethiopia could access. Because from what I understand, now they have to pay like a big fees to Djibouti to be able to use their ports. Right, right. So, so like this treaty would, would, you know, would really help them economically. But from like what I see in the media right now, like everyone's against it. Because again, Somaliland is not really recognized as a country. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a part of Somalia's land. Yep. So Somalia is like, we don't agree with that. This is our land. So now they're going back and forth on everything. And Ethiopia, they really need access to the coast because they cannot even offer them money. They have to offer them a stake in Ethiopian airlines because that, they're like really poor. That's crazy, dude. And you brought up a good point. I actually, that, I didn't even think about that, that Ethiopia is pretty much, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a landlocked country. Mm-hmm. So, so that is pretty big for them. Yeah, like back of the day, they were not landlocked, but you know, because of all these like internal wars and everything. Yep, yep. So that they became landlocked. Um, and sp- speaking of the Somali pirates, from what, like, what I understand, it's not even right now that they're attacking ships or, you know, or like cargo, stuff like that. It's more kidnappings? It's, it's more of like even doing it, doing it on the land. Because now all these ships, they, of course, they have secu- security. Like they have a couple guys with the guns and yep. st- stuff like that. So it's more of, let's say, if they see tourists being in the car, they're going to stop them yep. you know, with a few ka- Kalashnikovs. They're going to take them out and, and going to make them pay the ram- ransom. Even that American German journalist, the, I think his name is Michael Scott. I hope I'm not getting mistaken with the name. He said that once they kidnapped him, they literally asked for twenty million dollars of a ransom. Yeah, and and it's been a it's been a year that they literally didn't budge, and after a year they you know they they took care of him for so long. After two years, they finally agreed to one point six million. So his family, like German Think institutions, about that one point six million. Yep. That's why, like, when those pirates see a foreigner they see dollar signs because they're going right away for the ransom like you said like they went from 20 and i think i actually know the guy you're talking about if i'm not mistaken they held on to him for quite some time yeah it was over two years that's crazy dude that, that's that's crazy somalia is, an, is another interesting spot dude and from what i understand um, from i think it was his either his mom or someone saying in the docu- documentary about the situation that as they gave them the ransom like basically the bosses around the pirates, they were literally, they started fighting, started shooting between each other. Who's gonna get the you know, bigger cat of the ransom? Like, it's just, it's insane. I wonder how they like, how they sent that money, like through like Western Union or something or what? Honestly, I have no idea, but- The pirates I, were probably like, yo, this is our Bitcoin wallet. I have to believe that maybe they give it in cash, like- God only knows, dude, God only knows. Yes. Yeah, I don't really know any pirates myself, so. I know, dude, that's crazy, bro. <laughs> and, you know, th- there seen, I've seen a lot of people that, you know, that would hate on, on him for, like, going to, to Somalia because, of course, it's dangerous. And I see the point where people think that it's dangerous and, like, he should never be going there. But on the other hand, without people like him, which he's a journalist, we would really not know anything about countries like that. You know, I'm, I'm honestly torn on this topic because I look at it like this. I don't want to go to all the places that everyone's already been everyone's been to italy and taken a photo standing right outside the coliseum everyone's been in cities like paris or berlin or barcelona for me it's honestly boring i don't want to go somewhere like go to rome sit down in a restaurant and the person come over to me and say in english hey what are you going to have to eat today i I simply don't want that experience so i get what you're saying like he 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 was looking for a very raw travel experience it's it's, you know it's not even about raw travel experience he was a journalist so what i understand he was trying to like either make an article or like a document or something but again without people like this we're never gonna know anything about countries like that it's very very true so it's kind of they're shining the light on like how are all these countries you know how is everything going in there inside of them but and and, you know just stemming from what you said similar to what i said back in the first episode no matter where you are in the world, there's somehow travelers there. There's somehow a tourism scene with restaurants, mm-hmm. people starting up tourism, like guides type businesses. It's crazy, dude. 
Yeah. And that's that's only gonna progress as time goes on. Like you can look up any country on earth. I don't care what it is. It could be the tiny island like Tuvalu or anything. You're gonna find that information about that country. You're gonna find places to stay. So, no, hundred percent. You know, with this globalization, as you said, some countries is gonna be tougher to get into. As you said, Turkmenistan, that you that you love, to get in there, you're gonna have to pay like two, three, four thousand dollars to just get a visa. You're gonna be able to go there for three, four days. But it's in some type of sense, it's like exciting. Not not many people have been there. It's exciting for sure. It, it really it's just is so much different than like the life we we'll live. So like you kind of want to experience it, right? I love going to those off the beaten path destinations. I've always been a very curious person, but I always had like that thirst to, to, to go places where other people have not gone before. Or I know this is going to sound crazy. If people say a place is, let's just say, not safe. Mm -hmm. I still am curious about that just because that's how I've always been. You know, for me, it's more of like, I don't want to go to the places that are so overcrowded. Like now you're going to try to go to Venice. You're going to try to go to Rome. It's literally, you're standing on top of each other. Like there's so many tourists. And, and not to mention, dude, you're, you're, get, you're getting ripped in terms of prices anywhere that you go. You're getting ripped on prices, whether it's for taxis, food, alcohol, you name it, you're going to get screwed. First of all, like you're paying insane amount of money. Again, you have to deal with like all these other tourists, which is like so many people. Like, I can't enjoy my vacation if there's like a million people right, right around me. Yeah, it's, I simply don't like it. Like, for me, I rather go. Let's say if I'm going to an island, I, I want to let's say go to somewhere that's not so popular, not so packed. Something a little bit more low key. Exactly. Like if you're going to the Caribbean, you correct me if I'm wrong. You don't want to do Dominican Republic. Like you'll go there because obviously it's a beautiful place. Yeah. But you want maybe something a little bit more like St. Bart's. Yeah, of course. Something like that. Something a little bit like, more low-key. Like, you know, if, if you're able to, like, financially afford it, like, you know, sign bars, like Turks and Caicos, like, places that are that are maybe not as popular. And obviously, you know that I'm a big fan of Greenland, and I can't wait to go to Greenland. But again, like, this is so expensive. Just to go from US to Greenland, you have to either go to, go to either Iceland or Denmark. That's the only two places where you can the fly only two from. You can fly the only two. And again, flights are very expensive. Yeah, and from what I understand, all these attractions and like getting around the island is also expensive. Yep, and everything is imported over there as well. But sooner or later, I'll get there. I hope you would, you would come come with me. We, we're we'll, gonna... we'll do an iconic, iconic podcast episode out there. Which, by the way, guys, we're actually gonna be in Europe in Prague, Czech Republic, come the end of this month. Like as Connor said before, I'm not sure exactly when this episode is gonna officially air, but we are gonna be in Prague, Czech Republic, doing an episode. So. You probably will see some episodes in the future where we do travel, go to interesting places. We both very, we're both travel enthusiasts. We like that kind of thing. So make sure you guys, if you're not already subscribed to the channel. Yeah. So uh, in, in the future, I, I foresee us going to a lot of different places, and if we can even record like a shorter. By the way, speaking of which, they got Eskimos over there in Greenland. That just dawned on me, or my 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 Yeah, bugging. yeah they do. They, they do, do right. And don't they have also like their own indigenous people? Like I don't I don't want to call them. Inuits, but they're like something like that, right? I, th that? I think Inuit is the, is the correct name. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure if, if the name Eskimo is accepted anymore. Because oh, it's I, not? <laughs> it might be not anymore. You never know. Okay, I got it. <laughs> I, I probably just hit on some forbidden shit, right? Maybe maybe you did. Maybe you did. And uh, real quick, before before we, we get done with the episode, I just wanted to, t to touch on, uh, on North Korea for the last time. From what I heard since um, Kim Jong-un actually came to power. By the way, leave a comment down below. How much Bitcoin do you think Kim Jong-un has? Oof. All right. After all that stake hackings and everything, they probably have a lot they of money. A ton. In there. They have a ton. They're probably a whale. Yes. So from what I understand, uh, since, since, since early 2000s and since like Kim Jong-un came to power, the price of brokers and the price of being able to defect doubled, tripled, quadrupled. They skyrocketed. So now it's like even harder to be able to escape that country. Yeah. So so when you like think about living there, it just it has to be a horror. It has to honestly be a horror. Dude. That's crazy. I, I love the North Korean combos. I love conspiracizing about that. Like just talking about like what's up over there. But dude, listen, I think we got a great episode in for today. We should probably at this point wrap up, but make sure you guys, like I said, are subscribed to the channel because we are going to get another episode out coming next Monday. So Thanks again for everyone that did share us on social media, by the way. We greatly appreciate it. Help us grow the podcast to our first 1K subscribers. And Connor, do you want to add anything in final, bro? Thank you so much for watching, guys. And look out for us on every Monday uh, on YouTube. And you're going to see the short clips of us on TikTok, 
um, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. Thank you so much, guys. Take care. Signing out. Peace.